All right. Okay, so we are in week three of this series we're doing. It's a seven-week series, but because of next weekend, my buddy John's coming in, it's going to be an eight-week. All right? Can we, can we handle it for, can we take a break next week and then come back to it? Are we okay with that? Is anybody like, are we getting something from this, this I am uh, statement that Jesus says, these seven I am statements? And we've talked about this every week that this I am is two Greek words put together. I am either means ego that we get our ego from or emi, which is existence. And so he combined those two to be the, the ego emi, which is I am, I am. And so we've seen that in Exodus 3, 3 where he says, tell them that the I am, that I am who I am, tell them I am sent you. And so Jesus in all of these I am statements is claiming to be the son of man, the son of God, God himself. And this is blowing the minds of these Pharisees and these Jewish leaders. And they're just, they're really confused. And so for the last couple of weeks, we went through, uh, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And we talked about how uh, we need to have that not only physical nourishment in our lives, but we need to have that spiritual nourishment in our lives. And we, does anybody remember that uh, acronym we used? The, the four letters that we put together. Does everybody remember? RPMs. Yes, it was. The RPMs. Exactly. If you're revving up your RPMs, it's a gauge of how you're doing, right? And the RPM stood for reading. Be in your Bible. Read. Pray. Like be in prayer. Meet. Meet with other believers, with other Christians. Meet. Uh, share your testimony is the S. Share the gospel everywhere you go. Um, you're talking about sharing with the young lady that uh, the intern that's with you is all you do is you just continue to read, pray, meet, and just share. It's amazing uh, what sharing your testimony will do uh, in somebody's life that you don't even realize. So that was the, the first week, the bread of life. And then last week we talked about Jesus saying, I am the light of the world, right? And light always overcomes darkness. Right? If you open that door, if you crack open that door in the middle of the night with the hallway light on, the light always comes into the dark. The dark doesn't go into the light. Right? And one of the things we talked about is quit putting shadows in your life. Right? If the light is shining over your darkness and the light can overtake your darkness in your life, whether it be your sins, addictions, whatever it is that makes you feel like you're still in bondage, quit causing the shadows. We talked about confessing those sins, giving those to God. He took those sins and he paid the price for that. So quit stepping back into the cell and closing the door, right? And after this, right after we talked about that, um, we, there's a passage, there's a part of this uh, John 8 uh, that comes after I'm the light that I wanted to hit on real quick. And just two little sections, we didn't talk about it last week, but it's really important because we have to get to where we're going today. And so if we look at John 8, 31 through 36, it'll be on the screen. <clears throat> it, it says this. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We talked about that last week. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Oh, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Remember, that's stepping back into that cage. That's causing those shadows. Now, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. And here we go. Look at, look at uh, verse 36. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Now, 4th of July is coming next weekend, but I always, whenever I have this underlined and I have it written, so if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. I always imagine if this was a movie, it would be like Chuck Norris at the very end of the movie, walking out and explosions behind him, you know, fireworks and all that stuff, and it's just roll credits, right? That is one of those, those statements that Jesus makes. It's like, oh, why do we keep putting ourselves in this cage and prison ourselves when, when we've been set free. And then we just jump down here to verse 42, 42 through 47, real quick. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I come from God and now I am here. I have not come on my own, but he sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? He's like, why do you not get this, right? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You 
Oh, here we go. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. Wow. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I'm telling you the truth, why don't you believe me? He who belongs to God, hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. Wow, right? This is like, you belong to your father, the devil. You carry out your father's desire. He says, you're not listening. And that's why we have all these I am statements. He says, I am the bread of life. Listen, I'm the new manna, right? You need to be physically and spiritually nourished. I am the truth. Listen to what I say. He says, I'm the light of the world. Remember, they would have known about light. That would have been a big thing after the Feast of the Tabernacle. They would have known the importance of light. He says, I'm the light of the world. And he says, you still don't get it. You're still not getting it. So this week, we're going to actually talk about one of probably, I'm going to say probably one of the least popular I am statements. And then after next weekend, we're going to get to one of the more popular ones, the, the Good Shepherd. But this week, we're going to talk about the gate, where he says, I am the gate. And so I want to pray uh, before we jump into this. And, and then we're going, to, uh, we're going to dig in and see why he says, I am the gate. All right. Let me uh, pray for us. Father, I, I thank you for our time. I thank you that uh, you have, for some reason, uh, put somebody who is fighting allergies and no voice up here uh, to speak on, uh, on your behalf. Father, let my, my odd sounding voice slip away and let your vo voice be heard loud and clear. Let my thoughts be overtaken by your thoughts and let your will overtake my will. Father, as we spend this short time together, I just ask that your, your presence is felt, that the Holy Spirit is alive and just overflowing in this place. Father, without you, this means nothing. So I ask you to bless our time together and to bless this normal human standing here sharing this gospel. I assist in your son's name. Amen. <clears throat> All right. So we're going to take a little journey uh, because that was John 8, right? We were talking about John 8 and then the gate, I am the gate is in John 10. But we're going to just kind of, there's a little bit that's happening in between 8 and 10. And that would be what? Verse 9, right? Or uh, chapter 9. So what we're going to do is um, we're leaving John 8. We're going to go into 9. We did a teaching a few weeks ago. It was called All I Know. And if you were here for that, we talked about how Jesus he comes up and he approaches this blind man. And he was blind from birth. This is the very beginning of John 9. And his disciples asked, was this man blind because of his sins or because of his parents' sins? Right? And Jesus says, remember what he says? He goes, no, no, it wasn't because of their sins. It was so God can be glorified. And at this time, they would have been like, I don't, okay, you know, we're not following here. And so he heals this blind man. He, he makes him see. And he says, he's going to go uh, bathe in the, the pool of uh, Siloam, right? And he goes and he, and he can see. And the Pharisees, they're ticked. Remember, they were mad. They were like, why did Jesus do this? Who does he think he is? And, and so he, he does that and, and they start questioning him. And multiple times they question his parents. And he's an adult. We can read from some of this. He had to have been at least an adult because they're like, I, you ask him, right? And so he, they say, why? How? And he, he says, all I know is that I was blind, and now I see. I was physically blind, but now I physically see. He goes, I can't explain it. You go ask Jesus yourself, right? And these Pharisees, they are, they're mad. They're really confused. They don't know what to do. And there's something here uh, in John 35, it, it jumps down. Jesus goes and finds him because they kick him out. They kick him out of, of town. They're like, no, we, you know. We're not okay with this. Leave. The blind men, they kick out. And so Jesus hears this, and he goes and he finds this, and he has a conversation with this blind man that can now see in earshot of these guys. And they overhear something he's saying. And he asks this guy that can now see, he says, do you believe in the Son of Man? And it's in verse 35 of John 9. Do you believe 
in the Son of Man. He says, Lord, I believe. And the Pharisees do something. The Pharisees, they go, are we blind? Are, 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 are we blind? And Jesus, he basically tells them that they're phys they can physically see, but they're spiritually blind. Right? They physically have light, but they have spiritual darkness. They, they're physically teaching the word of God, but they're spiritually now true, now malnutritioned. Okay? So he's saying, you guys are putting on a good show, but you're not doing what's best for me. You're doing what's best for you. All right, so we're going to we're going to take this into John 10 and we're going to I'm going to read John 10 1 through 6 and we're going to dig into that and then we'll do the second half of this. So if you want to follow along uh, or it'll be on the screen in John chapter 10 1 through 6. I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brought out all, when he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him. Because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. All right, so they don't, they don't get it. And so he's talking about a sheep pen. And this would have been something they would have known about uh, in that time, the agriculture and the farming and raising sheep. And Bill, you talked about raising sheep earlier. Have you ever raised sheep? Has anybody ever raised sheep in here? Steve, we know, hasn't. He's smarter than that, right? But so it, they would have had a pen. Sheep would have been kept in a pen and it would have most likely been stone wall or brick wall of some sort, stone, and it would have had one gate, one way in, one way out, right? And, and it wasn't to trap them or, or to punish them. It was to protect them, right? And it says here, if anyone going in, well, they're going to have to come over the wall. And if they're coming over the wall, they're going to be thieves and robbers, and, and he says something here. He says, sheep follow the shepherd. Did you catch why they follow the shepherd? And Bill, you talk about this too. They follow the shepherd because they know his voice. Anybody remember having little babies? Uh, where They're small, but as they get to get a few months old, um, you can have people in the house. You can have them laying there. They can be in bed. And as soon as you kind of walk by and you talk, they turn their head because they recognize your voice. Right? Especially for moms, because they've been listening to that for nine months in the womb, that, that sound. And then when they hear, it's, it's really cool to see a baby turn to a mother's face. And the dads were basically nothing for the first six months. But the mom's voice is really good, right? Uh, they follow, and they don't follow a stranger. It says the sheep, they won't follow a stranger. Now, we've completely messed this up with Uber. Have we not? Like our parents taught us, do not get in a car with a stranger ever. Unless you need a ride somewhere, then call an Uber and jump in a car with somebody you have no idea who they are that you're going to trust to take you wherever you need to go. This is messed up. And we pay them. We pay somebody we don't know. Oh, anyway, it's weird. All right. But I, I really do love the way Jesus uses these metaphors um, because hey, that's my style. I, I, I'm not a very good, uh, when I read scripture, a lot of times it's just, I don't get it. But if there's a metaphor, I'm like, oh, I get that. Right? It's a little easier for me. For me, if I'm talking to my boys, I'm going to use a sports analogy or something uh, about uh, social media or what they're dealing with in their lives. And that's what Jesus has done here. But then he goes on in verse 7 through 10. And he's going to kind of reveal something to him here. So let's read uh, John 10, 7 through 10, and see kind of his response to this. He set them up. He's put them in a, in a visual thing that they can uh, recognize. And then this is what he says. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever come before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they have life and have it 
to the full. Oh, so there it is. I am the gate. All right, so he reveals this to them. And they're just like, oh, he did it again. He just did this again. He just, he set us up and then he revealed something. He's saying he's a guy, he's seen this gate. And now he's going to unpack this. Look in verse nine. What does he say in verse nine right here? I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and out and find pastures. He's talking there. Before him are the thieves and robbers. I think I had that in the wrong verse I had written down here. Uh, yeah. So he says that the thieves and the robbers uh, are the ones that, are, that came before him. And he's talking about the Pharisees. Right? He's talking about these guys. They're, they're, uh, they care more about their own power. They care about their own glory and control, their own will, their own ways, and their own systems. They've kind of been teaching that it's their path through them that you will be saved and there's this righteousness. It's a dangerous thing, right? There's these thieves and they're like stealing the glory from God. And Jesus says, he is the gate and only through Jesus will you be saved. There's only one gate. There's only one way. It's through his power, his glory, his control, his will, his way, and only through his system that we'll be saved. I think a lot of us struggle about this. I think about these gates and I think about what kind of gates were they talking about? Where were they thinking they were as a gate? Does anybody remember um, as a kid, do we have chalk, like sidewalk chalk as a kid? I don't remember having ch sidewalk chalk. I mean, like chalk was for teachers and you didn't touch it. I remember in school, like don't touch the chalk. And if you were really honoring and you had those friends, they'd smack the racers together and cause the dust clouds and it was a mess. And that was always fun. Um, I remember, remember the, the little handle with the metal thing that you put the chalk and you draw the line and you could get real fancy and, and get in trouble for that, right? But my littles, my five and nine year old and the neighbor kids, they love this new sidewalk chalk that they have. There's 1,500 colors of it. They're drawing on everything. I come home from work once in a while and there's chalk art everywhere. I mean, they've got, I don't know, scenes of like, horror movies acted out on, it's like, what is wrong with these children, <laughs> right? I go into the garage, we have a garage, we had a finished garage, but we never painted it. You know, it's the knockdown, and you can see the mud and tape, it's all ready to be painted. It's been sitting like that for six years. But there is chalk art on the walls in the garage. There's chalk art on the garage door. I've even seen chalk art on the cars. They love drawing with chalk and it's like stop <laughs> but they don't get it. they're just drawing right and i think that we do this ourselves it's like you imagine that pen that brick wall that stone wall with the one gate and the one way in the one way out that jesus is that gate but sometimes i think we're kind of maybe drawing our own gates once in a while we're like, it, it, we can draw that gate and we can make it kind of look pretty neat we'll put a window in that you know put a fancy handle on that we'll make it all kinds of pretty colors right and there's, there's there's only one gate right and and so it's not even a real gate that we're driving there's one real gate and so we're drawing these gates and, and maybe that gate looks like power maybe it looks like success maybe it looks like beauty maybe it looks like perfection maybe it's perfection in ourselves or our spouse or our kids or, or our employees whatever it is and and there's nothing wrong with with wanting to be successful and to look nice and to, and expect high levels of expectations in our life. They're not always bad things, but sometimes these can be our idols. These can become the things in our life that we, we go after. Maybe it's sports, maybe it's uh, cars, maybe whatever it is. There's these things that we, we seek and it kind of is over here drawn on a wall when, when we should be focused on this game. Right, because this is the one gate that we are saved that salvation and righteousness. And he says, we can come in and we can come out, right? And so, <laughs> oh, I actually wrote this down. Um, there's two different kinds of sheep, right? There's those that are consumed with personal idols of this world. And then there's those that are saved through Jesus Christ. And I actually wrote this down. Uh, sheep are dumb. <laughs> right? And Bill was saying, sheep are dumb, right? Have you ever been to a petting zoo or, or raised sheep? I mean, you, you've raised sheep. Um, sheep are dumb. I mean, they need guidance, right? They need a shepherd, right? And we're kind of like those sheep, are we not? We, we need guidance. 
We need a shepherd. We, know, we need one that's going to guide us and, and lead us. And, and so I think about what consumes us. What consumes our thoughts in our life? Is it our own desires and our idols that uh, have elevated our lives? Because social media and just the media and, and the worldly view has done that. You've you got to be on this diet or you've got to look this way or you've got to wear this brand or you've got to wear a mask or not wear a mask. You've got to get this vaccine or not this vaccine. I don't know. There's so much stuff out there. Or, 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 or what do we focus on? We focus on that stuff. We focus on Jesus who wants us to love God and love others. Love God and love others. If he is the center of our lives, then that gate is right there. I coach baseball, and I know that's where uh, Scott and his family are. They have a baseball tournament this morning. Um, but one of the things I'm constantly telling our kids in the dugout during a game is keep the gate closed. Right There's the gate that goes out to the field. And when we're at bat and we have all the kids in the dugout, they're all, you know, jabbering in there. They're all getting excited. They get the bats clanking on the ground, dropping them. I don't know why they got to hold on to them, but they do, right? And the gate is sitting there wide open. And the umpire has to turn over and says, close the gate. They go, why do we have to close the gate? It's easier to go in and out if the gate's just wide open. It's to protect you. That's why. So a foul ball doesn't come in and smack you in the head while you're messing around, not paying attention. Right? The gate is not there because you're in trouble. The gate is there to protect you. Right? And so when, when we choose Jesus as our gate, when we choose that gate, there's not only protection, but there's provision. There's hope. There's grace. There's mercy. There's forgiveness. And there's freedom. There's actually freedom in being protected by our Lord and Savior. Amen? So when we choose that gate, we step into the light of the world. And we get to celebrate that bread of life. If you're going to choose that gate, then we've got to hose down that chalk art on the wall. We've got to get rid of that mess. Right? We've got to, we've got to wipe it clean. We've got to erase the board. We've got to get rid of all that stuff that we thought was pretty drawings on the wall. And we've got to focus on that gate. Because if we're going to try to walk through those gates, what's going to happen? We're going to smack our head on the wall. We're not going anywhere. Right? We're not going anywhere. If we're going to choose that gate, we need to hose down the chalk guard. Listen, you're, I think we've, ah, I see this in teenagers a lot with youth, when I'm working with youth, is they find their value in things that don't give them their value. Right? We choose, we draw these gates. I think, you know, I'm going to get my value in money or looks or, or uh, power or fame or our family. A lot of times we think, well, you know, our kids are very successful in this. We're going to just ride that and let them make a name for us. We get our value in things uh, that don't give us value. Even how good we are as a person does not give us value. You know, those are our worldly views, but your value as a sheep, <laughs> as a sheep in the flock that passes through the only gate of salvation to have freedom It'll never come in the worldly view. It'll never come in the things that the world says you have value in. That value will only come from whose you are. And if you are a son or a daughter of our Lord and Savior, then you have value. And that's where your value is. This gate that he says, I am the gate. This gate that you have access to. That is where value. That is where we put our hope. That is where we put our our, our needs and our wants in that gate because drawing them on the wall is just smacking your head. It's just smacking your head. So as a church, what is our, what is our role in that? Bill, you nailed it. The door has got to be open. Our gate or our door to the church has to be welcoming. It has to be, this is a safe place that you can come and you can be fed and that you can be, have light, spiritually light, spiritual nourishment, spiritual freedom that if we're going to be the church we have to come in this place be fed and go out into this community and we've got to continue to share the gospel and spread the gospel not only in this community but the communities around us in our nation and across the world i'm excited for what this church is going to do in this community because i feel that this church is hungry 
I have been in multiple churches, um, similar size, and you don't see the hunger that I see in this church. And it excites me because it makes me just want to encourage you and resource you and encourage you to go and do get up and go. And, and I'm excited that because this is a great place to see that. I see the board out there of the missionaries and the ministries that this church supports, the food pantry that this church supports. The gospel is alive and well in here, and it's time to just step up and to continue to be the church. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the gate. I thank you that through you that we do have freedom, that we do have provision, and we have hope and grace and mercy. And Father, we know that only through you can we be saved. And that you died on that cross so that we can so that we can share in your love and not chalk art on the wall. Father, I just ask for forgiveness. I just ask for forgiveness for the, for the times that myself and my brothers and sisters have continually tried to make different paths for ourselves. We just ask for your, uh, your love and your mercy. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.